Um, we will have two speakers. Uh, the second one after the break will be One Man Nation, who will show a setup there and talk a bit about that. Uh, we will start with uh, Kassen, who's a DJ um, Chuck programmer. It's set on the list. Um, I'm not sure if he's going to talk about if he's going to talk about that. Um, he will also actually um, present uh, an analog synth setup uh, from Jorgen Brinkman, who's Time's instrument maker and who has his own like analog studio in the basement of Stein. Um, it's far more extended than this, but I think his idea was to give an example of different uh, generations of analog uh, sequencing. So Kassen will present a bit about it also. Um, so I'll give the word to you, Kassen. Okay, so good afternoon. Um, yeah, I will be mainly talking about my own uh, uh, sequencer, which I uh, uh, wrote and designed specifically for live performance, live uh, uh, improvisation. But to place this in a context and to illustrate some of the issues I had with uh, sequencers that I tried before, we'll use some of the, uh, the ones that Jochen provided us uh, with. Um, I would like to start with uh, the combination here of the, the MS20 synthesizer and the from memory for SQ10, I think the, the, the sequencer is called. This is uh, pretty much a model of the really early synthesizers uh, uh, and uh, uh, sequencers, how they worked. This is a semi-modular synthesizer um, where the, the sequencers, they would be used in, I think, starting with like the 70s to uh, create these uh, uh, automated uh, musical patterns. Uh, and this one right now is set up um, uh, that the pattern will start playing as soon as you hit, uh, hit the key. So, uh, this is a sequence that is transposing the, the keyboard keys used as kind of arpeggio. So people will be using this uh, uh, in their uh, studio, tweaking their uh, uh, synthesizer sounds and um, uh, tweaking their sequences to, to end up with these uh, pattern-based pieces that would uh, keep evolving. Um, and so you have some uh, uh, interaction, but I wouldn't call the sequencer directly playable as um, as a straight uh, uh, instrument for, for improvisation. Um, because, like, if you, uh, and also if you want, want to start another song, you would have to set up the whole thing again and set all of these settings, um, which are non-quantized at all, so you have to tune everything by ear, which is uh, quite an uh, involved and relatively slow uh, process, which can, of course, lead to, to really beautiful, really interesting very carefully constructed uh, results, but um, not something that I would um, you know, call a live instrument. Uh, and maybe the most extreme example of that in, in hardware is a really famous Roland TB303, uh, uh, the one over here, which is uh, really the, the sound of, of acid music. To, to refresh everybody's memory. Like. Uh, really, really typical, really classical sound, but these are notorious for being extremely laborious to program, uh, where you have to, with the arcane system, enter the whole sequence and then uh, uh, play it back. Where you have set it up, where it's uh, uh, saved. To the to the variable there, you can at least modulate the, the filter. And so change the uh, 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 sequence uh, uh, interactively, at least for uh, uh, filter cutoff. But um, I think the 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 TB303, most of the you know, the classical Roland. Uh, uh, sequences, which are really interesting because they pretty much formed the, the foundation of what we now call you know, house music, electro music, and so on. Uh, it was intended 
originally as like a practice instrument. So uh, this was supposed to be an emulation of a, a bass guitar. Um, <clears throat> Um, and so the idea was that the guitarist would, would program this and then uh, play over it, maybe using like uh, one of their uh, um, uh, drum computers as, as uh, a substitute for the drummer, so he could practice guitar on his own. It was never intended as uh, an instrument for live improvisation. And um, so most of, of this whole, whole series of, of, of XOX style sequences, it, uh, it isn't. It's, um, it's really slow to, to work with. And I think um, that's actually a, a problem that nearly all commercial sequencers have where they are intended to be uh, used for this practice process or, or in the more modern ones uh, where the uh, act of sequencing is completely integrated with the act of uh, a recording a piece. Like the, uh, uh, the modern, uh, what we call DOS, the digital audio workstations, they're both recording uh, uh, devices and sequencing devices um, intended to control instruments and not intended to uh, uh, act as an instrument um, on their own. Um, you can wonder why, why not, but it, 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 it evolved in, uh, uh, in this direction. Another example that Jochem supplied us with is um, this program, of which I forgot the name, Synchronizer, I think it's called, from the uh, uh, mid 90s, which emulates uh, a huge layout of, of, of this type of sequencer. Um, that uses uh, this principle, at least this type of, of, of interface. Um, uh, to generate MIDI notes, and so um, you can use a lot more sequences in a lot more elaborate ways than you could probably with something like the uh, SQ10 operator because analog sequencers are quite expensive. They use lots and lots of knobs, which is one of the main things that makes an instrument expensive. So with this emulation, um, you could use a, a representation of a lot more equipment than you would normally own um, with a lot more, more power uh, of control using uh, MIDI, but um, at the expense of having to operate all of the parameters. Um, I think we may have something in order of magnitude of 250 parameters on this screen right now, all of which need to be operated with the, uh, with the mouse or uh, touch that. Well, at least with these, you could grab two, or if you're dexterous, uh, uh, three or four knobs at the same time. Uh, they will always be at the same position. So where the um, digital representation has a lot of power, a lot of advantages, if we look purely at the features on an interface level, um, you could argue that it's actually taking a step back. Um, which leads me to um, my own work and my, my, my own frustrations, which are mainly relative to uh, <coughs> Ableton Live. Um, not because Ableton is a bad program at all, I, I, I own it myself, and uh, I think it's really good for a lot of things. I think um, we don't have a demo setup of it right now, but I assume everybody knows it. And now, um, and we've seen quite a few examples of it in the previous session, uh, Tim using it in the mapping session. Um, Ableton is a really nice program for restructuring pre-prepared uh, or, or uh, material um, as a mode of live performance. Maybe a way like, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, like the DJing that we talked about in the in the last session, but. Um, it's not at all that suited for writing material uh, on the spot. At least I would, uh, I would say right now. Uh, I think Mark will actually demonstrate uh, doing this at Ableton uh, uh, supplemented with, uh, with pure data. Um, but the issue I was running into was that I would be using Ableton on stage with the uh, material I, I uh, prepared before in, in my studio that I recorded 
or that I MIDI sequenced in Ableton, I would be playing this for an audience, <coughs> and then a few things would happen. I would sometimes have new musical ideas while on stage, because if you're in uh, a performance situation, especially a club situation, it's a really stimulating environment, uh, lots of things happening at, uh, uh, at the same time, and so that's the kind of environment where you may get new ideas, and so then you're stuck playing on stage, playing, playing music, uh, um, uh, maybe with the audience having an idea of you creating the music at, at the time where you want to create this music that you just thought of and you have a problem because um, you may just be thinking of like a seven note bass line. You would have to enter all of them one by one uh, with a mouse using the uh, uh, screen as feedback or playing them on a, a MIDI keyboard, which I, for example, am not at all uh, good at. Another issue that I had was that I would prepare my material at home in, in my own little messy bedroom studio where I would be working for hours on, on simple loops to tweak them to perfection. And if you're sitting in a situation like that, then you get a certain uh, frame of mind, at least I do. Uh, I would get into a more calm uh, relaxed frame of mind and would be uh, making a lot of ambient techno. Um, and then you go on stage in a club environment and you can wonder whether this more introverted style of music that I think the home studio invites um, is the perfect music for, for that environment where you might want something a bit more upbeat, a bit more uh, uh, extrovert. And so at some point I said, okay, Ableton is really nice to, to, to mix with, to compose with, to restructure existing material, but it's not for me to, to improvise with, and that's really the direction I wanted to go. And so I said, I'm not going to, to perform with Ableton anymore, actually I'm not going to do any live performances until I sorted out this issue. And so I started uh, writing my own sequencer uh, after looking at, at the commercial uh, offerings many hardware ones uh, that didn't seem to line up with everything that I wanted. Um, and I resolved to write it in Chuck, which is a programming language uh, meant specifically for, uh, for audio. It comes from Princeton University, um, now used in quite a few universities for education, and um, also used by musicians to write their own instruments or write their music directly in Chuck. I, I have to admit that I started out quite naively and uh, actually trying to copy, I suppose, the kind of functionality of drum computers like, like the uh, Roland ones. And as an interface, I was using my uh, laptop keyboards. I still have a look, quite a few stickers on it to relabel the uh, functionality. And um, this worked to, to a large degree, but I also ran into the problem that the laptop has a lot of keys in a mainly uh, homogeneous uh, field, and it's um, hard to figure exactly where what key was, and they're quite small, so um, that didn't have the kind of physical uh, quality to it that I was looking for. Um, at this point, I would like to claim that I thought about this really deeply and did maybe a lot of research, but what actually happened was that I was thinking about this while stepping around my um, rather messy room and I almost stumbled over uh, one of the, the arcade style joystick, not, not this one, uh, I, I got it later, but a, a smaller one, arcade style joysticks I was using to play PlayStation 2 games with. And uh, thinking about this question of sequencing and the interface to it, which I wanted to be more fluent, and then looking at, at the joystick, it kind of made me have this mental jump, which I uh, uh, based my sequencer on. Because what I realized was that if you have a house beat, then it's uh, uh, eight counts to a loop, roughly, or you have 16, but the, but the core of it is eight counts. And uh, one of the things that I was running into um, with the more traditional sequences track direct was that you would have a linear line with all of the uh, 
beats, the positions on it, but actually I was experiencing uh, the beat to be more circular because it uh, repeats. And arcade joysticks uh, just do up, down, left and right. And so that gives you eight positions aside from the center one that are more, uh, um, uh, going around in a circle. So I thought, what if I map these eight positions uh, in space to the, uh, these eight counts in a, uh, in a house beat? And so I did that. Um, and I used my, uh, my buttons to um, uh, trigger the beats. So to, to quickly illustrate this idea, if I push my joystick up and then hit a kick drum, then we'll now have a kick on the first step of the loop. Um, now if I pull it down and hit the snare, You get a, a, a snare at, um, and what's really nice about this, I very quickly figured uh, out that you have this circle, and I push something on the opposite spot of the circle, down and set up, and this translates really nicely to this symmetrical uh, uh, spacing of these two sounds. And so that's where I started figuring that this might actually be a really natural way to um, uh, interface to the um, uh, uh, timing of a beat. So I was I was wondering if you're playing mm -hmm. want to play a sequencer like an instrument. What actually is your instrument? Is you know this sequencer as an object? Is that the instrument? Is that what you want to play? And I think it may not. That may not be true. I think what um, the intuitive choice there may be actually that we want to use the loop as the instrument, we want to play the loop instead of the individual sound. Um, I think most of, of the stuff is going on with times people wanting to play individual sounds very, very directly. The thing is just that with uh, music like house or techno, you will want to play a lot of sounds at the same time. And so your input should preferably be slightly faster than real time, or maybe a lot faster than real time, because you don't have to if you have like an eight minutes uh, a house track, you don't have the time to play, uh, spend eight minutes playing bass because you also want beats with it, you maybe want a, a synth line and, uh, uh, and so on. So we have to play multiple things at the same time. Okay, so um, we want to do this very quickly. Let's uh, take this, uh, uh, this example and talk about hi-hats, which I will place on the diagonal corners of my circular uh, joystick, like. So now I place these hi-hats faster than um, the beat takes to go around in, uh, 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 in a circle. This is a really important um, uh, property for me to have in order to you know, be able to start out playing with all empty patterns and, and build up a, a house track. One of the first things that I figured that I would need to be able to do would be to write the main loop of, of a composition, you know, the, 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 the basic foundation of the house track, and would need to be able to write it in the amount of time uh, uh, intro of a house track would last. And so the process of writing it would turn into uh, the introduction. So speed is really important here. And um, which led me to the question of taking advantage of, of muscle memory, which I'm not sure traditional sequencers do to, to a sufficient degree. I think muscle memory is really uh, uh, important if you want to speed up uh, a data entry process, which is, uh, is it as well. Um, so this worked. I had, I had this with, uh, with four sounds and, and um, uh, entering rhythms into the sequencer very quickly. I had it working uh, quite quickly. I had a prototype uh, when I started programming, something like two hours, and then I probably spent the next three hours playing around with it. And I thought, I, I, I have something here. Um, I know Stein uh, works a lot with um, confronting children with their interfaces to, to uh, 
figure out whether they work, whether they work well. And I didn't have any children around, and so I press ganged my friends. For example, I press ganged a mathematician friend of mine who doesn't play music at all. He appreciates music, he collects music, but he doesn't play it. And I was like, okay, so this is how it works. You have the circle, you have your drums, go play. And I sat off to the side, and my friend, uh, uh, Allard, he's called, um, he sat there, cross-legged on the, on the floor, just focusing on the uh, sound and, and playing. And then after a while, he pointed at the joystick and said, Kassam, where can I get one of these? This is lots of fun. And then I thought, okay, now I am going in the right direction. Now it's going right because he's pointing at the joystick. He's completely ignoring that there is actually the computer, uh, which does all of the work, and he's just playing on, on you know, 20 euro uh, uh, cheap arcade stick. And so I thought I will continue in this direction. I thought this is the uh, the answer to my my questions about uh, performance, but. Um, I wasn't there at all because if we let's delete all of it. If we had like a basic house beat, um, this is this is nice. But um, we also want to have um, melodic sounds. We want to have a bass line, and um, we want to have a lead line. We want to do things with those. And how do we do this? Um, and I knew I wanted to focus on um, uh, the percussive effects of, of melodic sounds in house music. I thought in, in house music, even the melodic sounds have a strong uh, um, uh, element of timing. They're very much a part of the rhythm. And so I wanted to enter them in the same way. I considered like learning to play them live on a MIDI keyboard on top of everything, but I thought it would be throwing away this nice interface that I had. So I started. So now I have baseline notes that are entered in the same way from the same interface, except that these baseline notes they should have a property of pitch. And um, right now they, they were all in the in the fundamental of the scale that I'm uh, that I'm using. So how do I get this uh, pitch in there? And I experimented with quite a lot of stuff. I experimented with having like little algorithms that would look at the timing and the spacing of the notes and generate a melody based on this. And um, partially inspired by the by the video game Res, which was one of my inspirations, like a musical. A video game with all of the sound effects quantized to the beat and integrated with the, with the music that's playing in the background. And this was nice, but it turned out that these algorithms, the right one for every bank of sounds, it was a lot of work. It was, and um, also it wasn't very creative because it came up with melodies that were interesting, but I didn't really feel I was actually playing those. So I wondered, how am I going to enter pitches? Um, and then I figured what you have, if you have house music, then you have, get this feeling like, there, I want some different pitch, like, there. Uh, at least that's how I feel, you're sitting on a dance floor, listening to somebody else's music. So I thought I will try to use this kind of idea, where you indicate there the tone is going to be. So I mapped a row of keys on my keyboard, because I have the keyboard with me anyway, and the buttons are there already. Um, so it would be at least uh, a good way to prototype. I have uh, the buttons on my scale, so I hit a uh, note. And the next note of bass line uh, uh, type that will play get this pitch assigned to it. Um, this is a little waiting list cue, so if you have like a melodic idea, you can just enter it and... Uh, uh, we'll get really bored with this if I keep it running uh, while I talk. Um, and uh, so that, to me, I don't know about how every, anybody else experiences house music and desire to, to affect these, these rhythm. But that, to me, this interface um, works in the same way that, that I experience the music, I experience my desire to uh, uh, affect it. So I did the same thing with uh, uh, different kinds of intonations. So I have like slides and... Uh, accents, uh, sort of uh, um, arpeggios, and they get assigned in the exact same way. Um, 
Uh, and the same thing with the lead line. Let's just get a lead line. So there you have like the foundation of a uh, of a track, maybe even add accents. And so um, that to me was was a good uh, uh, way of of entering this data because one thing I really feared was this traditional. Uh, hardware sequencer interface where you have to, if you want to affect the note, you have to first select it using like a cursor or a jog dial and go like, I want to affect this note, I want to have a property like its velocity or its pitch and you set that and by the time, even if you, you know, know very well how the sequencer works, by the time you did that, uh, you just edited one note and the, the, the composition is, you know, already four bars on. And uh, if we want to write this kind of music in real time, we don't have the time for that. Um, or, or the al uh, alternative is to enter it using using a keyboard. But um, I just didn't want to do that. I don't like piano style keyboards that much. I played them for a long time because I used to play accordion as a child. But I don't really like them for electronic music. Um, so we um, uh, we have this and, and 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 this works. We can very quickly save a pattern. We can uh, um, I don't know like experimentally muck it up. And if we think this sucks, we can reload the original one. Um, so uh, that's nice. So. Um, so where do you where do you where do you go from there? I was kind of running out of, of buttons um, because I also wanted mute functionality. I wanted a functionality to delete all of a certain uh, type of sound in case I got really confused and I didn't like the hi hats at all anymore. I wanted to just be able to get rid of them very quickly without having to uh, look them up. Um, let's load the end button. Um, because I was getting lost, I was getting lost in the beat. I'm not using intentionally not using uh, visual feedback at all, so I, I uh, purposefully didn't uh, uh, use the projection monitor here. Um, <laughs> uh, but I was getting lost. And this was the next thing I think, one of the next things that I needed a solution to. And so what I thought, if I'm not using visual feedback at all, maybe the way to be able to tell where I am is to uh, to use audio feedback and so if I hit play now right now we're playing a completely uh, uh, empty pattern because I had loads on something where uh, where nothing was saved if I push my joystick up at some point it will the uh, when the clock that you know virtually is running around the joystick when it goes through the position the joystick is pointing in it will make a sound. I have different sounds for, for every th uh, song, so they fit, and I just use them straight in the main mix, so the audience listens to them as well. Um, uh, you can kind of use them as an effect, but they're meant to, if we want to know where in uh, 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 the beat we are, so if we, let's say, mute the hi hats, want to know, like, this spot, Like the but yeah, now we have a spot like a prop goes and we can hit. And then at that point. Yeah. So at that point you will have uh, 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 a sound. So we know again uh, where we are. We know again how this uh, uh, repeating loop relates to, to the, the, the circle around the uh, joystick without um, visual feedback. Um, I think audio feedback in, in musical instruments, it sounds like a really beyond, beyond the straight operation of the, uh, of the instrument because of course all instruments have audio feedback. I think it's a, a pretty interesting concept um, that I would like to do more with. It's just not that clear to me exactly where I will use it or, or exactly how. Um, but I think that's an a, a interesting idea 
probably more interesting than having this whole feedback chain of having to look at your screen. <laughs> oh, that's not right. It needs to be different. No, that is right. Um, I think if you're de working with music, then having all of your feedback in the audio realm is a, is a good idea. So now I had run out of functionality on, on my joystick. So I could have made a larger joystick, but I wasn't... Well, also I'm lazy. And so you start looking around. What other controllers can I use? I have a laptop keyboard, but it's quite boring. And so I uh, noticed these really nice uh, toys for this PlayStation game called Beat Mania um, that already look like musical instruments that look you know, fun because they're meant to be toys. And um, I was using PlayStation to USB converters anyway. And they were really cheap because I could get these at 15 euro each at a game store. And so, um, yeah, and they're really inviting. And you have a different kind of interface. Like we talked uh, this morning about uh, uh, circular rotating interfaces of turntables being being nice and inviting. And of course, these are much cheaper, more primitive than the than the ones used by uh, uh, Taco and so on. But um, they're great fun. And so I thought I would use these uh, to do things like uh, uh, have little variations. So um, at first I tried scratching. Actually, it's still, still in there like a little bit when the whole thing is paused. But what do you do with... Um, it's probably more... Hmm. Really primitive, but it's but it's fun. Uh, what do you what do you do with scratching uh, while the sequencer is running? Is it at all clear? I experimented with that, but the manipulation on on the sound is a waveform while also the sequencer, you know, running all of these controlling all of these waveforms in a, a data format. It's conflicted, and it, I couldn't get it right. It wasn't really clear exactly what stuff like reversing had to mean in this context, and. Um, it just it wasn't it wasn't a coherent combination of factors. So what I thought I would do instead is kind of use this idea of manipulating the turntable as a, a inspiration, and um, going with that instead of a literal uh, 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 usage of of this kind of interface. So I thought if you like spin it back, how how should that affect the sound? And I thought it would be nice to get like. Get the sound stuck, or in four loops, with a really classic build-up like, yay! Uh, well, it's a, it's a bit overused, but it's a nice, uh, a, a nice kind of way of dealing with that. Also, what I like about this is that it takes continual force to keep turning it back, which I think is good because getting the whole thing stuck in such a short loop is greatly simplifying the whole thing. If you keep doing it too long, it, it gets uh, boring. So it's nice to have this thing which is exciting when you know it starts, uh, but gets boring after a while to cost force. Uh, and, and with going forward, I, I thought it would be nice to have like doublings or that you can actually reverse the sounds by turning it forwards. It's kind of in go in, but then you you know you have only so many options so you um, you make do um, and then I thought I would I would just have a have a delay on top of it also I would have like cut it out if you uh, play it back again but then the delay gave me gave me a lot of trouble as well because the delay is always uh, uh, I have a, a few settings for it for delay length, um, and that's um, that's nice. You can you can have delays at different lengths, but they they were too exact. And I thought should I have like little rounding errors in my settings? But then that sounded equally boring. So um, I wanted to have a better way of uh, uh, dealing with uh, with the delay time. Uh, also, in the same period, I talked with Taku because I thought the direction of time that we was going in with time was kind of uh, the same type of thing that I was working on with this. 
And so I demonstrated uh, this setup to Taco, and Taco said, well, this is nice, but I notice you're only using like these discrete on-off uh, push-a-button uh, 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 controllers, and you're not using uh, uh, anything continuous. Um, and I thought he's right. But I also thought, you know, I, I am using Norm Modular, which is right now below the table, but even it's not covered up, uh, for, for baselines and lead lines. Um, and it has lots of knobs, and I could tweak sounds that way, but um, that's a really different kind of interface. So somehow for my brain, combining these very strongly timed tick, tick, tick uh, uh, buttons with this gradual uh, uh, button movement, it didn't, it didn't line up. So I wanted to get a way of getting continuous data out of these discrete buttons. And then I thought, well, in a way you can get continuous data out of it because if, if these on-off switches have anything very clearly, it's timing, which is the kind of games that you know, these uh, joysticks get used for. They're very timing intensive. And so um, what I ended up doing is detecting when I spin the uh, uh, adjusting back, how much time it takes before I start turning it forwards again, opening the delay, and setting that to the delay length, assuming uh, uh, that is within the length of the buffer. So, So that's um, my kind of perspective on, on these types of interfaces and how um, like thinking that, um, maybe my main way of thinking in, in solving all of these questions about improvising techno on the spot, um, I was just sitting down with controllers that I thought would be suitable and without the computer turned on just playing with them and trying to figure out what I was imagining it should sound like when I made certain movements and then pretty much making them work in that way. Uh, also, when it would turn out I was consistently using the wrong button uh, for some function, I would just switch swap the functionality around and make the behavior that I was making anyway the correct one. Uh, that's quite nice if you write your, uh, write your own software. That is really easy to, to just make your wrong habits the right ones. Um, there's of course quite a bit you know, more to this, like I have more rhythmic uh, uh, effects on my uh, uh, drum samples. I have some shortcuts to help um, quickly manipulate melodies, like transposing them or adding like a hi-hat to every count on which there's a bass note and that kind of thing. Um, but I think this is pretty much my general perspective on, on solving uh, this kind of question. Um, <coughs> is there like, uh, do people have really urgent questions about this? Maybe, uh, yeah? Uh, one of the questions. Um, how do you map intensity of what you do to the music? I, I see when you're programming. Yeah. The, the rhythm is like yeah. Yeah. And then it's there, and it, it to me it looks like uh, okay now there's a lot of input. Yes. But then it takes a while and then. Yes. That's the next step, actually, why I talked about the delay thing last, because that's really where I want to go. Um, because I think yes, this is meaningful data, like how how quickly you're you're uh, tapping the buttons, but also on what beat, because I can program you know the. The, the first beat of the loop on the third beat, but it might also be, uh, I might be tapping the button slightly off beat, and maybe if I, I'm tapping them slightly off beat in the same way, coherently, uh, consistently, that might indicate like a, a, a desire somewhere in my uh, mind for to have a certain type of shuffle, for example, or a really quick input might mean that I'm working on a build up. So it could mean that, uh, or especially really quick in, uh, inputs that turns more sounds on, because you could also detect that. And that might, should perhaps translate to, to certain types of effects on the drums that represent that kind of 
uh, mood. Actually, I've been thinking, but this turns out to not be such an easy question, that maybe I should have like a continual analysis of the way I'm pushing buttons and use this to uh, modulate the BPM as well as maybe you know all of the uh, uh, effects that I'm using because I have quite a few effects that have timing elements in there and all of those loops uh, could be uh, modulated using input tempo instead of this rather but a primitive way of using the, uh, the cursor keys. So I have been experimenting with that uh, with my drum roll variations where uh, where the, 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 the timing of the movement of the joystick modulates both pitch and, and, and the speed of the, of the drum rolls. Um, so this is my, my prototype of that kind of idea which is still very primitive because it doesn't integrate with the rest at all. The drum rolls just end up on, on top of the rest and they don't interact with it. But I think actually the where I want to go, but it's kind of like putting everything on quicksand. Um, so it's, it may be a bit daring. It could be that if I would be playing like some especially large gig for maybe like especially large amount of money or, or um, whatever, that I would get nervous during uh, an attempt to play like a more ambient song and this would wreck it all up but on the other hand it's um yeah i think that's the direction i want to go with this yeah but it's not without danger and it will make playing it even harder and there's already quite a bit to remember i think you were all this question yeah um i really like uh you've got them i think it's really great but i think um you're struggling still with the the idea of inputting continuous data. We have an example with the setting the delay length yes. by measuring the time between yes. forwards and backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, to me, isn't really inputting continuous data in the sense that. Okay, it's not continuous, but it is like a. a, a, a it's, a it's a floating point number instead yes, of a, a binary one. Right. Yes. I agree. I, I agree. I agree, and and maybe this uh, thing that I just talked about of uh, continually analyzing the uh, speed of the input and the style of input would you could see that as a continuous uh, uh, controller, but perhaps at an especially low rate. But yeah, that's a question, and but I think it's mainly one of of terminology. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, you, the use? I mean, Joystick and you've got uh, the two turning pads. I mean, yeah. well, I'm not seeing I, uh, everything's there. Yes. But for me, house and acid music is not twiddly music. Uh, in the, you're modulating uh, to cut off rots. Yes. In live sense. Yes. I, 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 I agree. It's not twiddly music. Uh, I don't agree that that would inherently mean that I need to be twiddling knobs uh -huh. to, to make this type of music if I don't experience this as coherent with the rest of the internet. Maybe I will, I will go in that direction anyway because maybe in a few months uh, uh, it will, I don't know, I will have different ideas about. But right now I'm more interested in analyzing the style of input and applying that information to the kind of things you would normally use knobs for. But uh, yes, I agree. And, and actually, you could argue, you know, is this uh, uh, is it still acid if you treat it in that way? You could you could wonder. Is this acid? Yeah, I don't really particular. That's the question. Probably, if you're asking that on a on a night out, you have a problem. <laughs> uh, uh, no. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a good question. I don't really. Think I can can give like a definitive yes no uh, uh, answer, but yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You were what is the what? Uh, the what? The tempo. There's a BPM uh, uh, is set, 
when I load my uh, sounds, so I have banks of sounds that have these four drums, a lead line and a bass line, and it, at that spot it also loads uh, um, BPM setting and an amount of shuffle to use that work with uh, uh, these type of sounds, because I think the decay of sounds of, of percussive sound, melodic sounds, relates very closely to both swing and, and BPM. And so I thought if I'm going to preset uh, um, uh, these samples and, and, and uh, synth sounds, I should also preset BPM because they're, they're related. But I can, uh, I can modulate it. Like I can speed it up considerably. And Probably not in the in the way in a in a way that would enable me to very easily sync to to um, uh, for example acoustical performers. I think ideally I, I would need to be able to, but um, yeah, this idea of analyzing the input and, and applying that data it turns out not to be such an easy thing, and that's that's the kind of direction where I want to go. Though I've also been thinking that if you're scratching before you hit start. Um, that maybe I should analyze this timing as well so that when I hit start after that it will take that as a BPM maybe with like the delta between going backwards and forwards applied to shuffle. And do you use this for heating? Sorry? Do you use this as like kind of a heating set? Well as, as, as electronic dance music like performance, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. And, and so I will play, play one song using a bank of sounds like this and I will, I will quit it and uh, load a different one, like, I don't know which one did I like. And it will have a little break while all of the sounds load, and I'm analyzing the sounds because I want to know their zero crossings, I want to know their decay, so I can tune some, some effects. And I will have, um, I don't know. And so yeah, play play the next song, and yeah, that's my my, my performance. I'm preferably playing as close as possible to the audience because I find that people really <laughs> pick up on on everything being performed on the spot, even if the literal way the functionality is is built isn't clear uh, to everybody. But yeah, that's the way. Can you change between patterns? Sorry, I'm this. Yeah, can I change between what? Yes, I can, I, I can save them, like during the uh, demonstration a few times I just loaded an empty one, but I can very quickly save them holding this button and pressing one of these keys, and then when I press the key again, it will load it. Or I can hold the other button and uh, uh, press the uh, key, and it will start loading it at the uh, next one of the sequence. And, and this also has like a little cue, and so I can hold this and, and, and go like that, and it will play the three sequences in, in, in sequence. Yeah. So, yes. Yes. Could you imagine to do the sample yourself? Um, yeah. Yeah, actually, I think what we were just talking about is in a way, but in a very, very loose and, and like abstract way, using pretty much every button as a tap tempo. I suppose that's what I'm looking for, like using every button as a tap tempo, but analyzing this in a more clever way, because if you go like to half tempo or double tempo, it should probably interpret it as the same kind of thing. And it probably shouldn't be reacting instantaneously. But um, yeah, that's where I want to go. But it's not clear to me how this would work. It would probably be a fairly tricky algorithm to balance. You, you were you, you, you was holding your finger up. Again, it's, it's a question related to the first one. Yeah. Particularly to do with the arcade controller. Uh, yeah. The, the buttons of the controller like that, yes. um, to me, they really uh, they, uh, they mean a decisive moment. Yes. Uh, in, a, in a game. Yes, yes, like yes. That. To me as well. And the way, uh, as well, the way you use them at the moment, you are, you are recording step uh, data. Yes, but that is because I am not playing the sounds directly yeah. and instead 
considering the, the repeating loop as my instrument. Yes, I was wondering, uh, if, so there's, there seems to be a kind of mismatch there, at least in terms of my... Um, well, there is an intentional mismatch. Yeah. There's an intentional mismatch because what I want to do is enter data faster than real time. This time, as there, a lot of uh, stuff here has been about real-time performance, but because I want to play several instruments at the same time, I need to be able to be faster than real-time. And so there is an intentional mismatch there. Yeah. So I think, I think this is a really ingenious system for, for doing exactly that. Thank you. Uh, I wondered if you were completely comfortable with, with that uh, disconnect, you know, the fire button not representing the uh, immediate punch. Yeah, I think I am. I think I am, though Though I'm also thinking about getting back to a different kind of, of more direct connection. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I think you were... Yeah. yeah. I think what you're saying is very important. At the same time, you're actually uh, uh, using a real-life analogy. You know, certain things you're going to say and you're thinking of them before you're saying them. So, in a way... In yeah, a absolutely. Right. And you can also have the situation where, you know, you, where you bump into each other, where you already your brain has already given signals to your body, like, go do this. And then you see the bike, but the signal was already given and you step in. So, but maybe that's just as a reflection of what my colleague is. The question I simply have is you're looking at uh, all sorts of analysis methods of your behavior, right? Yes. And you're probably thinking Cartesian, so there's all sorts of ways that you're trying to... So you're thinking about what? Cartesian, right? Well, uh, coordinates. It's coordinates. Yes, right. yes, right. So I've looked at neural networks as a simple way of uh, finding a way where you can use all sorts of uh, uh, inputs that get correlated, get related, that get yeah. works on a training basis, and then you come up with something which gives you high level, high level uh, yes. information. Yes, yes. Well, neural networks, in, for what I know of that, I, I briefly used to study artificial intelligence, actually. I agree with you that neural networks are a really simple way to implement this. I don't think neural networks are a simple thing to implement. Is optimizing and structuring a neural network. And also, you have to train it, uh, ideally in an automated way. And often, I think with neural networks, the real question is how can we train it in an automated way? Because I'm not going to say yes, no for 10,000 generations of, of manually. And so, um, I don't think I will be doing that because I'm afraid of how much work it will turn out to be in practice. I think you were, yeah, you were first. There's just two things I didn't understand technically. Yes. One is you have eight positions on the joystick. I do. You said on the measure you have eight points, but yes. the loop was actually two measures long. This is right. Yeah. Yes, because what I, uh, uh, it turned out that for me, the eight uh, steps, um, it was really, it's really nice for just drums, but with me uh, melodies it gets to be too short. So I took a, a little bit of inspiration from um, uh, sequences like the 808, and I have two halves. You know, and um, I actually select them using left and right with with my, uh, my right uh, button on the top right, and I uh, select left and right. But I also use up and down at the same time to link and unlink them. So normally this is in the uh, um, for the audience top left corner. And uh, uh, I'm se I've selected the right half and they're linked. So if I hit like four kick drums, it will be in both uh, 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 halves. But you can select them independently and uh, uh, say whether this operation will affect uh, uh, both halves or, or just one. But this also sometimes leads to confusion. But it's, I think it's a, uh, at least it works with my mental map because it's also left, right, and, and uh, as like a spatial component. Um, and it enables me to use 16 steps uh, uh, from, from an 8-step controller. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, uh, it's really intriguing how you take all this time to learn different patterns, map them, and not play them in real time. Mm -hmm. And it works beautifully. Yeah, but uh, you can use like spatial at memory. At the same time, like this, it. of course, has to come from me. <laughs> at the same time, it is fresh very, <clears throat> well, um, basic. Yes. Um, also, these controllers are really basic because they just register whether the thing is standing still, yeah. going left, or going right. But I want to have still have the time if you do it in beforehand. You're going to scratch. Then you can make one gesture that is a bit more complex, like uh, this VJ showed here had yeah. these uh, yeah. gestures. Yeah. 
and then you could have. Yes, I agree. I agree, but I don't think it's worth with these because uh, the the scratch thing, though, it's an optical encoder, and it should be able to register speed. It it doesn't. Also, because the game it's meant for is quite simple. But I want to replace those two with uh, a custom controller with uh, the um, uh, optical mm -hmm. encoders to have be able to detect speed and have uh, more subtle, higher, maybe even higher level gestures or or more direct control because now I, with the backspinning thing I'm using buttons to set the rate at which it does this but that's also quite clumsy. It would be nicer to have like shorter loops if you're spinning extremely faster, uh, fastly and, and keep it hanging at four loops if you just go gently for example. That might be... But that's still a real time control. You can, yes. You can move that to, to preparatory. Uh, so you prepare the, the, the thing you're going to play if it's a scratch, if it's something else but by... Uh, Recognizing what kind of gesture you have. You can I could. have a, for instance, uh, back and forth mm -hmm. just before the beat will yeah. be the perfect execution of a scratch. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could have also be thinking about having uh, um, uh, all of the effects that I use on drums inspired by, by scratching and maybe have like a better emulation of the scratch style sound to. to go with that and then that would be a really interesting, maybe a more interesting uh, way of uh, inputting those effects on drums than, than the uh, buttons would be. That's not a bad idea. But then I want better better controllers for the scratching because these are really primitive. They're cute and I enjoy them but they're really primitive and for I think it's one of the bottlenecks of the system. For high level control they seem appropriate for what you do. Yeah, probably. Yeah, maybe that's why I use them that way. Then I think we will have a break. Yes. I think and so. after well, that. Of course, thank you. <coughs> well. Thank you. So we'll have a short break. Also, I see the picture, people making pictures. Uh, you might have noticed that we are keeping a blog about the jamboree. If you want to post your pictures to that blog, just let me know. I can give you a login so you can actually upload them there. Also, if you feel like you want to share like your opinion on some of these sessions, you can also ask me for a login and you can just write something about it. Some people are already doing that, but again, feel free to uh, 